Okay, welcome everybody to the second Industry Leaders Lecture Series of the semester hosted by the College of Engineering at New York Tech and also the IEEE Region 1 and Region 2 and also the IEEE CompSci. Um, so I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Beheshti. Thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the last session of the Spring 2024 Industry Leaders Talk Series hosted by the New York Institute of Technologies College of Engineering and Computing Sciences. My name is Bavak Beheshti, Dean of the College. This series is co-hosted by our college, as well as the IEEE Region 1 and 2, and the IEEE Computer Society. Our audience today is composed of IEEE professional members, as well as student members from across the Northeastern United States. Uh, in addition to the College of Engineering's current students, uh, alumni, faculty, staff, and a number of distinguished guests. I would like to thank the College of Engineering's Dean's Executive Advisory Board, particularly its chair, Dr. Robert DeFazio, who has been instrumental in organizing this, this series. Today's presentation is a panel discussion titled Organizational Cybersecurity and Digital Risk. The panel discussing this topic is moderated by Dr. Michael Nizek, the college's director of the Entrepreneurship and Technology Innovation Center, ETEC, as well as an adjunct associate professor of computer science here at the college. The panelists are Ms. Barbara Porter, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Technology Officer at FragranceNet.com, Inc., Mr. Brian Monks, VP and Chief Security Officer at uh, UL LLC, uh, and uh, Mr. Alex Dow, Chief Innovation Officer at uh, Mirai Security Inc. Without any further ado, I will pass it on to the panel moderator, Dr. Nizek. Michael? Thank you so much, Dr. Beheshti. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel presentation on organizational cybersecurity and digital risk. Uh, I'm honored to be your host and moderator today um, uh, with our esteemed panelists, Barbara, Brian, and Alex. We're excited to hear from all of you. Um, one thing in order to kind of set the stage for uh, today's panel, I want to start with uh, four unsettling statistics from uh, Tech Target, IBM, Pontiac Institute, Accenture, and Cybersecurity Ventures. They are one: the cost of cybercrime is predicted to hit eight trillion dollars in 2024 and will grow to 10.5 trillion dollars by 2025. Wow. Two, identity fraud losses tallied a total of $52 billion and affected 42 million U.S. adults. It takes in, Three, it takes an average of 277 days for security teams to identify and contain a data breach. 277 days on average. Um, and four, even though 43% of the attacks are aimed at small and mid-sized businesses, only 14% of these businesses are prepared to defend themselves. Yikes. Those are some very scary and very summary type uh, statistics uh, out there today. So... Based on this current climate, um, what better way to try and navigate these tumultuous waters than to hear from those leaders who are on the front lines every day? Um, so with that, I ask uh, our esteemed panelists uh, to introduce themselves, their companies, give us a little initial overview of your role at your organization. Uh, and uh, the format of the panel after that will be, I'll move into some uh, more structured questions that we can discuss uh, and talk about. So if we're all ready to go, and I know I am, um, I'm excited about this. Uh, I want to start uh, with Barbara. I'll hand the floor over to you and hear from you and your organization and kind of a day in the life. Sure, sure. Uh, so Barbara Porter, uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Technology Officer for FragranceNet, also known as Fragrance.com. Uh, we're a uh, online retailer of fragrances and beauty items. We do actually have a few retail stores and we're expanding our retail footprint, which uh, introduces new cybersecurity challenges. Um, I've been with the company for 14 years. Uh, I've been working in industry for over 30 at this point uh, in various roles, you know, largely coming up through the IT, uh, the IT uh, pipeline. Um, I have my undergrad from New York Tech in computer science. I also have an MBA and a master of science in cybersecurity. Uh, day in the life. So my company uh, sees itself as a technology company that sells beauty. So uh, the website brings in probably about 90, almost 95% of our revenue. As I mentioned, we've, we've got three retail stores. Uh, we do some B2B, but uh, the majority of it is online. So when you have a website uh, that is bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars in, in revenue in every year, uh, you're an attractive target to uh, people who may want to try and disrupt your business. 
Um, so I'm over the IT operations. We write uh, most of our own software. So that presents its own challenges there. I'm also over uh, the uh, operation side of, of things, um, over our, our warehouses across the country and making sure you know order fulfillment runs effectively and efficiently. Uh, and because of my unique purview over IT and operations and being responsible for facilities, I see a lot of parallels between cybersecurity and physical security. So that's a little bit about me. That's great, Barbara. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and we'll go over to Brian. Uh, Brian, it might be your former career, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing uh, now and before and, and it, kind of a day in the life. Well, yeah, I, I work for Underwriters Laboratories. I, well, I retired from them uh, last year, but still quite heavily involved. UL is a test lab. We test electrical products from around the world, um, uh, from from most most com uh, companies. Um, about 23 billion labels every year are used or fixed to products that you have in your house, refrigerators, TVs, blenders, et cetera. So you can imagine, um, you know, the scope of security when people are just, you know, have all these uh, different points of entry into into your system. Uh, I started off uh, as an electrical engineer, got my uh, bachelor's from uh, New York Tech. Uh, then eventually throughout, the, as I my tenure went up in a, in a company and different things, I got involved in security. So I basically all the security of the organization, any 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 threat that could come our way, I was responsible for it. Be it digital, cyber, you know, executive security, data security, which is actually you touched on earlier. So it's, it's just huge uh, uh, theft of identity, and um, and so now I'm just uh, you know doing a lot with uh, other companies, helping them uh, figure their cyber. Um, uh, profile and what they have to do to to, to keep themselves from being uh, being a uh, 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 you know taken taken down. So, like, thank you for the invitation to participate. I'm looking forward to the to the conversation, and I'm sure I'm going to learn something from this. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we all are, and thank you. Can't wait to hear from your side as far as some of the questions we're going to ask from the UL's perspective. It's going to be great. Um, and finally, hand it over to Alex. You want to give us uh, a background and some some news on the company, a little bit of day in the life, Alex, on your side. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, I got into the industry in the mid '90s. Uh, I watched the movie Hackers and said, "Damn, I want to impress a young Angela Jolie by turning on the sprinkler system at school." Um, so, you know, I was definitely self-taught up until going to school. Uh, then got to join uh, Bell Canada's uh, Security Operations Center, which just gave me uh, a playground to uh, learn a variety of technologies uh, and then eventually got to move out to Vancouver uh, to build out a security operations center for the uh, 2010 Winter Olympics. Uh, I was supposed to be a temporary job. I was supposed to move back to Ottawa, but I sort of like the lack of winter out here. So uh, I ended up staying, uh, got into consulting, which again allowed me to get a variety of projects, technologies and problems. And uh in parallel, uh, I started, uh, uh, I co-founded uh, B-Sides Vancouver, which is a big hacker conference in Vancouver that's still running uh, strong today. Uh, and then, you know, within the first couple of years, realized there's a lot of smart people in Vancouver. There's either the companies that sell boxes or the big four consultancies. There's no middle ground. And that's really where Mirai was born. Uh, and we're a pure play uh, consultancy helping uh, organizations uh, take risk uh, on the on the technology side by helping them secure their digital transformation projects, uh, be compliant and and help sell their ability to uh, enable their customers uh, to be secure. That's great. Thank you, Alex. I'll have you know that that I did look up at my sprinkler system. So if it does go off, we'll know it's you. <laughs> And it's being recorded, so as we have proof. Uh, okay, so now we're going to transition um, uh, into the uh, questions portion. Again, take a few minutes to answer each question from your perspective. If you want to kind of discuss and argue amongst yourselves, that's a lot of fun too. So, uh, and if I have any questions, I'll throw anything in uh, um, as well. For the um, folks joining us through um, through Zoom, there is a Q and A session at the end. So make some notes, post your uh, questions in the chat there. Uh, Jill is going to read them at the end and, and our panelists can uh, answer them uh, the best they can. All right, so off we go. So for question one, uh, with double digit annual increases in successful cyber attacks around the globe and frequent and recent high profile ransomware attacks, including MoveIt, City of Dallas and our very own Suffolk County government offices, 
right here on Long Island. How can an organization continue to protect itself in this climate while still maintaining a high level of organizational performance? How can we do that? And what, what are some things we can learn from you uh, who do it every day? Uh, start with Barbara on this one. On the first question, we'll start with Barbara. Sure. Um, listen, every organization has to determine what they stand to lose if they were to become you know, the victim of a cyber attack and what they're willing to spend to protect against that possibility. Um, it looks different for every organization. So uh, Mike mentioned Suffolk County. So uh, not everyone on this call may be familiar, but Suffolk County is a neighboring county to New York Tech on Long Island. And uh, they had a cyber breach, I think it was September of 2022. Um, and as of a few months ago, there were still some services that were down. They, they basically unplugged all the, the services and slowly, you know, turned them back on as they felt that they, uh, you know, regained control of different parts of their infrastructure. It was really ugly. A lot of services, uh, like related to real estate transactions and things like that were affected for a very, very long time in the county. Um, you know, they, it was a ransomware attack. They refused to pay the ransomware. Uh, so if you look at it from a fiscal perspective, it was a win. They were able to restore services. They didn't have to pay the money, but their constituents, you know, were were uh, were harmed, you know, for a period of time. Now their constituents are the people who live in Suffolk County. You know, if it, if they were customers of a company, there's a good chance those customers would say, "Forget this company. I'm going to go find another company." Less likely that residents of Suffolk County are just going to up and move because of a cyber attack. So that was a very interesting, uh, you know, situation. But for most organizations, they have to, they're in, they're, they exist to create and keep customers. That's the point of the business. So you have to look at it as, you know, if you were attacked, if your services were disabled, if your data was stolen, what does that do with your relationship with your customers? And you know how do you how far do you want to go to protect that? If all you count, you know, if all you all the information you have on your customers is their email address and and their maybe their physical address, all of that information has been stolen on everyone in the United States at this point multiple times over. So it's not such a big deal. If you work, you know, in a HIPAA related industry, uh, regulated in industry, you know, where you're dealing with very sensitive personal information, you certainly have to go a lot further to protect that information. And that's going to be expensive. Absolutely. But I think, uh, interestingly, I think um, one of the reasons for, you know, inflation and costs going up has to do with just this overhead of cybersecurity protection that every organization finds itself in the same boat right now. We all have to deal with it. But how we deal with it really depends. It's different for every organization and it's based on, you know, what you what data you have and what the uh, the cost of a disruption or losing that data means to your business. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, it's amazing the costs, right? The costs just keep going up and it's like, you know, eventually, right? What are we going to do? So thank you, Barbara. That's a, a great, uh, great answer. A lot to think about. Uh, Brian, we'll go over to you now. So how can an organization continue to protect itself in this climate while still maintaining a high level of organizational performance? You want to talk to us from, from your yeah, perspective? It's, 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 it's tough and almost impossible. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, if, it's when you'll be attacked. Uh, they're doing it constantly. And, uh, you know, th there's bad people out there who get 24 hours, seven days a week to figure it out and, and get into your system. Um, you, you want to try and put different barriers up. Like when I created the sock in the company, but one thing I noticed when, when we were up and beginning our, you know, security you know, embryo there uh, to compartmentalize our systems. So when someone does get in and they can't get in, they, they can only go to the lobby. Let's take a house, for example, or an office. They can't go up to the second floor and ca ca capture information. They're stuck in one location and and there's very minimal information there and you put in barriers so they can't continue and so like one key doesn't open up every door or every uh, every database that you have uh, you want to make it difficult for them it's like uh, when people steal cars you know you etch the windows of your vin number on the glass uh, there's so target rich environment you know uh, if they've got to put more time in it time plus their money they'll move on to someone else i'm not saying that's solving the problem but at least it solves it so it solves your your problem. Um, uh, also, uh, 
a lot of it is, is, is we were going to talk about this, I'm sure, uh, the three of us, about people, you know, and the vulnerabilities of, of people. Uh, but, but ransomware is one of those things where I agree you, you can't pay. So what we used to do, or oh, I made happen is we updated our, our, our systems, you know, every, every, you know, several seconds. So we had a, a, a database. So if they got into it, we could, and it froze something, we had to go, to go back a little while, you know, in a short period of time and refresh that. Uh, we try to take all the nodes that we have open. A lot of, um, the companies we had, you know, thousands of different, um, you know, entries into our system. Some of them were old servers that couldn't even be patched. And of course, you know, you want to shut them down. And and here's the people problem. You say, um, you know, I'm going to shut that down. The next thing you know, it becomes sacred to them and they want to keep it and they don't care. It's their data. What's in it? I don't know. This kind of thing. So uh, they don't see the whole picture of, of the cyber, the cyber, uh, cyber attacks. So a lot of that is Make sure that you every every entry into your system is is got some sort of you know security in it, and then they look for the weakest link. So you know someone may go out and order some pizza off the internet from your company. The pizza parlor can probably doesn't have the same security systems that you have, and they can work their way back in. So a lot of things you got to look at. But one is like I said is try to make it as many as many barriers you can, even the simple ones. So they just frustrates them. They don't want to spend the time and they'll move on to you know company B. So okay. I mean I could, I can go on forever, but I mean No, you know, no, I'll, no, that's great. Like, oh. That's great. Thank you, Brian. Do you think uh, uh just a quick question though before we go on to Alex? So do you think that um the 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 simply the act of of putting these deterrence in and investing in them. Do you think that could affect organizational performance in general or are they kind of separate? Do you think putting these types of systems in could affect organizational performance or no? It's well it, it depends. Like you know, you go to two two factor of that's of this day, right? Right. So yeah, someone's not gonna take a few extra seconds to put in a second second password or certain certain second ver uh, verification. Uh people will complain, right? But most of this stuff, it can be really simply done with minimal disruption or actually zero disruption to to the employee or to the company in itself to you know to put out orders or to take in sales or or whatever their function happens to be. So you can do it, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, because on cyber you can spend whatever you want and and millions and if not billions of dollars and get very little return on it. So you have to look at what the what what your return is going to be, and some of can, like I said, you know, we not discuss security of the company, but it can be done very simply with a lot less money. And I said, all you want to do is deter these people. They're gonna, if listen, if you look at a state actor, you know, a state a, a country going to get in, they're going to get to your system. I don't care what you have, right? And they're they're really going to get in. You're not going to be able to stop them, but you wow. can. You know, in, in 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 a way, you really can't you really can't yeah. stop them. But but so you just have to make it difficult. Like I said, you want them to not bother, move on, because they can you know go to company B and and, and get in. So gotcha. Gotcha. thank you, Brian. Thank you. And one thing I want to add there is yes, that it, you know, uh, in my role as CTO and and COO, it, it's important to at times you know we have to tell the business or tell the tell the users, yes, this is an inconvenience but you need to do it. You know, uh, five, 10 years ago before, you know, these, these breaches and the impact of these breaches and ransomware attacks and things were really understood by senior executives in the board. You know, they didn't want to be inconvenienced themselves. So they wouldn't necessarily support things like multi-factor authentication or additional hoops that we made people jump through to ensure security. Now they get it. Now they realize there's a risk to their business. They don't want to see their business shut down for an hour, let alone yeah. a day, a week, a year. So we have a lot, you know, the technology team has much more, uh, you know, power to enforce these things, even so if it's a little bit of inconvenience for people, it's for the good of the company. Yeah. So we've seen that change, you think, on the executive side from five, 10 years ago that they're now being like, OK, great. They get it. They get it. And, and another follow on to what Brian said was, uh, you know, you can spend an endless amount of money on, on cybersecurity and you never really know how much you how much less you could have spent. Right. 
they only know, you know, the executives only know whether you had a breach or not. Did you spend a yeah. million dollars to prevent it? Would a hundred thousand have been enough? So it's it's a very different, uh, difficult balancing act to to try and justify some of these larger expenses sometimes. Yeah, yeah. great stuff. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Alex, how can an organization continue to protect itself in this climate while still maintaining a high level of organizational performance? Well, um, yeah, I, I want to echo what Barbara said is, uh, you know, how do you measure when something doesn't happen? You know, it, it's very challenging and it's it, it results in, did we spend too much money? Should we have cut the budget or are we not spending enough and we actually don't see the problem and we may actually already be compromised? Um, you know, I think like generally speaking, society and business at large is still behind the eight ball. Um, uh, and that's because, uh, and really to to the previous points is these risks are novel. The threat landscape is is, is continuing to evolve. Obviously, criminals uh, want to make money. They are going to continue to adjust their tactics to make sure that they mm -hmm. can uh, make money. Um, but these risks, up until fairly recently, um, were really not well understood by the business decision makers and the risk owners of the businesses um, and. The team of no, also known as security operations, uh, was the chicken little problem that they knew that these problems existed, but lack of anecdotal evidence, um, lack of uh, potential accountability against the business or uh, the executives meant that it was very hard to communicate what bad looks like, and thus they weren't really reacting to it. Um, and what that has done over, say, 20 years of digitalization of business uh, abroad, where pretty much every business is using computers one way or the other, is that we kept on using all the good stuff of the technology and not really considering um, what what we do need to manage from a risk perspective. Um, and I, you know, I'm sad to say that particularly out West, when I lived in Ottawa, cyber, uh, cybersecurity was ingrained in the culture, but out West, the West Coast, the left coast, um, you know, up until very, very recently, no one cared, uh, which made it really hard for me having a, a, a rock solid specialization and business be like, mm, seems expensive. Um, but what's happened over, you know, the, the you know, two decades of, of digitization of businesses is that we've built up this huge amount of, of tech debt, not really recognizing that the, you know, the cool things that we're bringing in to enable the business are actually creating a much larger attack surface. One that our, uh, that our technical teams really failed to communicate properly to the business. And thus they, they you know, there was apathy towards the, the concerns um, and we kept on building. That's also what I would call innovation bias that, yeah, let's, let's digitize this. Let's do that. Uh, let's build a, our own app, but not recognizing those consequences. And that, that debt is is now coming up uh, uh, to be paid. And a lot of businesses are struggling to meet compliance requirements, meet regulatory uh, requirements, and also their own customer requirements. Um, so back to like that balance is, well, first of all, the, the security team, the team that I used to be on really has to, if they haven't already, moved away from that team of no. Um, we have to, and you know, this was totally in my CISSP books and 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 in school. But it took me ten years in my career to actually recognize that what we do has to be enabling the business, and you've got to be able to tell the story of why doing something more difficultly, uh, preventing it from happening, etc., is a benefit to that business. Um, being able to communicate that to the business in business terms is a much better. Uh, way to be collaborative, be invited to those de decision making events in you know the, in the boardroom, um, and you can be uh, support the business uh, going forward. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be a balancing act, and um, you know to rise point is you can throw as much money as humanly possible at cyber uh, security technologies, and the salespeople encourage you to do that. That is you know, a strategy. Um, but that's not going to help. If you do not have the culture in place uh, at the executive level to understand what a bad day looks like, what, uh, you know, uh, in Barbara's case, what does the website down look like? What's the cost per hour? Uh, and how quickly can we, we recover that? Those conversations need to happen and they need, they need to be quantifiable. Um, that's going to be, in my mind, much better. And then lastly, and I think we'll get into it a little bit deeper, we are going to get breached. 
you need to be building your system not to be impenetrable, but recoverable and resilient to failure. Uh, because whether it is a hacker doing it or uh, an IT person, or even more likely your suppliers, something will happen, which will impact the the flow of, of money in your business. And you want to make sure that uh, that you can maneuver quickly to recover um, and uh, continue to be uh, making money. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Alex. So uh, on the on the one point of the, uh, you know, the, from the executive uh, you know, suite, from the C-suite as an example, you're you're saying quantify it, right? Don't don't let them think about cybersecurity, but think about what's what it really is going to look like. Um, you use the term "look like." Like, what does it look like to them financially? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, again, at the top of, of of a business, it is going to be typically about money or the the ability or inability to make money. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of work in the mining sector and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, that sector is very traditional old school, uh, arguably they're in the business of breaking rocks. Why does technology have anything to do with that? Well, turns out mining companies are actually using a lot of technology these days to make the art of breaking rocks more efficient, safer, uh, more reliable, et cetera. So when you start building a very complex um, uh, process within a, a, a mine, but any business in general, you have to understand like, well, what if that conveyor belt fails? Um, that, oh, that's a physical problem, likely not a cyber problem until hackers turn it off on you and, and ransom your conveyor belt. But that conveyor belt takes the crushed rock to put it on the train, that puts it on a boat, that's that sells it uh, to the market. If that stops you need to be able to uh, articulate what that costs. And, and you know, it, it very often in the mining sector, it's like measured in millions of dollars per hour of loss. Well, that's what the business understands. That's how you need to communicate. And it, while there is, you know, obviously uh, it's not as simple as a uh, firewall stops working or fails to do its job. And this, co this uh, you know, it costs this money. You need to look at it from a bigger picture of how does it impact the business process? Right. That's such a great, such a great point, and a and a great for our listeners too. Thank you, Alex. Uh, okay, so for for question two, um, those are those are wonderful answers and very useful um, to to all of us. Uh, for question two, it's a little bit more of a practical uh, question, so um, more of a more of a step by step, you know, uh, question. But uh, you know, in the past, um, the concern from most organizations was, what do I have to do? Um, what do I have that someone would want to steal? Uh, and that can include things like trade secrets, credit card information, banking information. Um, today, it doesn't just matter what the value of that information is on the street. It's more about how they can hurt you. So either by disrupting or embarrassing your organization. Um, in essence, if they can hurt you, they can extort you. So what are the most effective steps um, that you can take in as, as an organization to prepare for the inevitable attack? You've all mentioned the inevitability of this attack, right? Um, uh, from a threat agent to avoid such extortion attacks, right? So what are the steps? What can we do as organizations to avoid this potential extortion now that things have kind of changed from just the theft of it? So uh, I will start off uh, this one with Brian. We'll kind of kind of uh, go down the road here. So Brian, you want to start this one off? Yeah, just shut, don't use the internet. Just stop, shut it <laughs> down and go back Easy. to paper paper and pen. And this Easy. all goes Why away. <laughs> yeah, it, it really, I, I mean, that's such an open ended question. You, you, is I don't think anyone has really the answer. Uh, I, I knew one company that they, you know, they hacked into, um, which are a big company, because they wanted to. They were they had some of the drone technology from another company. So the the the, the bad guys went in to steal something not from this company, but to get access to the company that that had the the secrets. So and where's this data going? I don't know. If AI, the, this collection of data. Just last just last week, Morris Company, two of them uh, told me uh, they've been breached. Right, you mentioned two hundred seventy seven days. If you ever know, in two hundred seventy seven days, it's kind of kind of over. So, like I said, the steps I said earlier is you know just little things that make it difficult. You know, because uh, you can't you, you can't spend your way into this. You just you just you don't have you will never have the the, the capital or the time or the resources to to do it. So. Uh, I, I just look to uh, the people. We went to um, uh, change when we started security. Uh, a security journey was the people, and to educate educate them to look at phishing attacks. Uh, uh, 
I remember uh, to a hundred top executives, we did a phishing attack and 45% of them clicked on, on the link that would have been really bad if it was real. And that's our top executives, right? The top people in the company. So it's, it can be attacked any place. So, and the phishing now you'll see, and you know, uh, uh, the students on the, on, 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 online, they'll see it all the time, uh, you know, uh, emails coming to them and then companies, the same thing. And the sophistication of it is getting, getting larger as, you know, larger and larger. So a, a bigger, a better and better. So uh, to, to me, uh, it's just that deterrent, you know, you, you have to put, you know, some technology in place, but it's your people, education, educated people, it's take nodes or entries into your systems that are no longer necessary, patch them, get rid of them. You know, you'll find that people are, uh, as I said earlier, are very uh, protective. It's mine. I want it. Don't know why, but I keep it. It's it, it's it's it belongs to me. You can't touch it. And I said, Barbara said, you got to go in there sometimes. And say, hey, I don't give it. you I'm taking. I'm shutting you down because you are the inner threat that's causing caused me to have this uh, this, this this cyber attack. Uh, limit the information that you that you can, you can you can that they can get limited. The, the real Stuff your 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 the crown jewels, keep them, you know, keep them separate as you can. Don't put them in the general the general uh, you know uh, a, a data system. I know when I in my sock I talked one of my top guys. I said I want you when here's five thousand dollars, go to an electrical store buy a buy a uh, everything on you know everything you can buy like everyone else can get get the laptop get whatever you need, and I want you to see if you can break into our system. Did it in five minutes. He found the passwords. For all the executive assistants in the company, the executive assistants hold the keys to the kingdom. They have everything right in their computer in five minutes. So, you know, how do you get these better passwords? How do you continually move them? Most of the we found most of our uh, our uh, staff were using the same password for Google as they were for their for their uh, their own password that the companies. So things like that. I just you know I I think it's such a um, Open. There's no no silver bullet, you know. Uh, you just gotta, and, and not everyone's got billions of dollars. This could be a doctor's office. It could be a, a lawyer's office, you know. But it, but again, you know, uh, make the passwords ten digits. You know, make it difficult for them. You know, don't, don't have open servers. You know, don't don't you know if you AT and T or Verizon. You know, and that's another thing, by the way. Uh, Microsoft and all these big guys, they spend all the money. They've got they've got a technology that you can buy or use or get for free pretty cheaply. And also, real quick, and I know we'll go around it, the FBI, I know we was talked about it, HSI and FBI will actually help you and monitor and provide technology for you to protect your your, your systems. So there's there's things around the world that will help. Europol, big, big organization. Uh, that will can help you in, in cyber if you have a you know a European uh, a, a tentacle into Europe uh, Europe. So uh, again, I don't want to get too too, lent, too lengthy, but to me it was keep it local, keep it simple. You know, let people know that uh, you know uh, you know uh, that, that, that they have to before the link link on something they they have to let us know we had a system put in place where if something an anomaly hit, you know they could send it right to the security team. And within you know minutes, get in worldwide. We had a system. We we followed the Sun system around the world, in 120 countries. So we could get something. Someone could send something to us. Security team, no matter in the world, but whatever time zone, could get back to them, and say, "Hey, this is good, bad, or indifferent." Mm. That's great. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right. So uh, we will jump to Alex, and then go back to Barbara. Uh, so Alex, what are the steps? The practical steps somebody could take to kind of minimize these extortion tactics. So um, one thing I want to reflect on is like what I, I coin as the blue team fallacy, that if you give us another dollar, we can work extra hard and <laughs> stop the problem from happening. And, you know, I worked in a security operations environment for a long time, just buy more technology. Right. And that, that, that is, that is the problem with our industry that um, it is driven by salespeople. St salespeople-driven strategies is is insane to me because it has created a 
a technology rich and people and process poor environment. Um, now looking at that people and process side is, you know, reflecting that you know, were probably not going to be able to stop all things uh, to uh, Brian's point that eventually uh, if a threat actor is interested in you, they will get in one way or the other because there's just the attack surface is so broad from technology to humans. It's a, it is open at some point. Uh, and also to Brian's point is like, you know, we sort of joke up in Canada here that uh, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest person. And this is really about not trying to have an arms race with uh, an unlimited amount of adversaries, but rather making sure that you are not an easy target um, and that that uh, you're not the low hanging fruit that is everyone on the internet. Um, so, you know, from a, a steps perspective, is that acceptance? Uh, of uh, we are not going to be impenetrable, but rather uh, we want to be resilient. And that means uh, preparing for that, really understanding the, the business and understanding what's critical to uh, uh, making money, what are those dependencies, et cetera. Um, much of my consulting career outside of the, the, the technical side was in the assessment and architecture side. And, you know, first question would be like, what do you care about? What's important? And uh, they would say everything. So if everything is critical, then nothing is critical. And that's because we just don't have the budget, man, manpower resources to uh, be able to uh, secure everything. And certainly there's just things that are not that important to the business. Uh, so, you know, really recognizing what actually makes the business money, what, what data particularly uh, is critical to the business uh, is the first step. Then you know, doing the, doing the tabletop exercises to explore how bad could it get? It's a huge awareness opportunity for the executives. When we run tabletops, we, we really try to discourage it being just merely technical. Uh, we don't want to snooze the executives. We really want them to understand the technical limitations, the people and process limitations, um, of, of the current situation, and then make recommendations on, on how to weather the storm. Um, and really set a goal of like, building a resilient system where you don't have to pay the ransom and you don't have to rely on insurance, which is becoming less and less obtainable because, you know, it, for the last say decade, the insurance companies have been buying business. They've been giving away um, insurance, but that is no longer the case. They do, uh, you know, at the end of the day, insurance companies are not really in the business of paying out. So when they have an opportunity to uh, squirrel away, they're going to do it. And given, you know, what my previous points of we've got a lot of tech debt, we've got a lot of executive apathy and arguably negligence. That is a recipe to learn that your insurance is not going to cover you uh, and it will get uh, less and less uh, realistic. So we do need to be take some accountability. Um, and I would say, you know, lastly, it's, it's really about enabling the decision makers um, to to support building more resiliency. It isn't shiny, it isn't sexy, but um, the longevity of the organization is something that should appeal to them. And, you know, bring in an anecdotes of their competitors um, being impacted. We're, you know, we're working with a chicken farm right now and uh, several, you know, um, uh, uh, other in uh, businesses in that industry have had $10 million in, in multi-day uh, outages because of ransomware. And that does resonate with uh, the executives, regardless of uh, of how untechnical they are. At the end of the day, if they're not uh, making money, they, they they care about that. I think the, the, thank you, Alex. The best tagline there was insurance companies are not in the business of paying out, right? That's a, that's a lesson for all of us. Amen. Uh, so, uh, Alex, just you mentioned a few times, I just want to ask it kind of uh, um, some insight on it. You mentioned a few times about the, um, I guess, geographical differences in, in information security kind of uh, culture. Like, like why? What, why? Why the left coast, the west coast? Like, what's, what is that? What, what, what do you feel that's the purpose is? So, you know, I went to school uh, and, and really cut my teeth in the industry in Ottawa, our, our federal space. Um, so, you know, I had a security clearance. It was really sexy. As soon as I left Ottawa and moved out West, you know, I'm mentioning my credentials and et cetera. They're like, so like, we can't even validate if you actually do have security clearance because it is more of a, a thing for the government. 
Um, but really out West, uh, you know, culturally, you know, back in uh, 2015, I attended this uh, startup conference and was rubbing elbows with the VCs and uh, the startup people. And like, no one cared. And it was the, we're not a target. We're not big enough. We have nothing to steal. Um, and the worst one, which I find did not age well, is our acquirer will have the money to fix our problems, uh, which has actually resulted in, um, you know, actually a local company in Vancouver that was acquired by PayPal. They found that there was a huge flaw and uh, incident after acquisition. Shareholders sued PayPal and they scuttled the company, which actually impacted um, the company was serving a uh, uh, you know, people that didn't have bank accounts and needed to pay, you know, cell phone bills. So that company went out of business uh, because uh, it, it was so flawed. Um, and of course, shareholders uh, were impacted this way. Uh, so the, the the world has changed quite a bit with uh, VCs caring that they don't buy lemons. Um, and it's changed, but for, in my mind, sort of the wrong reasons. Security people, I, I would say on the left coast, uh, don't care about it. And that's because it's a very startup culture out in Vancouver, where Silicon Valley of the North up here, um, everyone's innovating and not necessarily caring about the reality and, and whatnot. But things are changing, uh, mainly not because people want to be secure, but because they want to be compliant so they can sell their products to other companies. So bigger uh, you know, enterprises are saying, love your SaaS. You know, this really solves a problem of ours but we're not actually interested in taking on additional risk. So can you fill out this questionnaire so we can understand if you know how to spell security? And that is that is raising the tides um, for uh, the startup world. Um, it is forcing uh, startup companies to look at uh, security and, and arguably privacy is the main driver here. Uh, security is just coming along for the ride. Uh, but that's why I am seeing a, an increase now. Okay, great, great stuff. Thank you. Um, Barbara, just a, a refresher for you. Um, so what are the steps an organization could take to kind of mitigate or reduce these, you know, these extortion taxes that are in use? Yeah. So, uh, you know, a couple of things came to mind, uh, come to mind, you know, listening to everybody. Um, there's, there's some real practical steps that can be taken. So patch management, you know, make sure you're aware of where your servers stand with patch updates, um, you know, implement them fast, but maybe not as soon as they're released because sometimes they themselves are flawed. So, uh, you know, you, you need to assess, uh, you know, what, what of those failed patches might mean and make sure you have a good rollback strategy. Uh, having backups. Backups uh, can be very helpful uh, if you were to, you know, be uh, subject, you know, fall victim to a ransomware attack, um, you know, where your your files get locked, your data gets locked. Um, but if your backups only go back 30 days, and let's say you write your own code and didn't realize that some portion of your code was compromised six months ago because it was a, a software supply chain attack. You know, somebody got in and, you know, modified your code, you didn't realize it, and you've been running on that code for a while, and if silently it wasn't causing any issues, but now it is. If you don't have a backup from before that event happening, then you're kind of stuck. Um, you know, things like third-party software um, and open software especially open source software, uh, you need to be very aware of what's in the code that you're using and really trust the companies that you're you're accepting code from. Uh, secrets management. How is your company managing secrets? And it could be, you know, passwords are the obvious one. It could be other things like bank account numbers and things like that as well. Um, Alex mentioned tabletop exercises. Absolutely a great idea to do periodically with your team to, you know, just walk through a crisis situation. And number one, make sure you really think through the problem ahead of time before you're in that, you know, kind of pressure cooker situation and maybe not able to think straight, um, you know, but also see, you know, from my level, see how people on the team react and, right. and are they able to think through problems or do they just panic and shut down, right? It's important to know. Um, penetration testing, right? So uh, we, want, we, we run a website that has hundreds of millions of people hitting it every day. So we, we, we joke that, you know, our, our website gets pen tested every day, but we have backend systems as well that are not open to the public. We, need, we pen test those periodically to make sure that, you know, we're, uh, we're aware of, of any risk, potential risks there. Um, you know, there's uh, assessment tools, assessment monitoring tools, things like Rapid7, Qualys, Tenable, 
other platforms that will help you monitor your environment and assess the health of your environment and, and the risks within your environment. It, it isn't, you know, if you're in a larger organization, listen, if you, you're in a pizza parlor and, and that Brian goes to for lunch, you probably don't have to worry about one of these tools. But if you're a larger organization, you absolutely need to have something in place that's helping you watch the shop for you because you know, people are not going to be able to do it for you effectively and efficiently. And the last piece are uh, formal and informal IT audits. So informal is, you know, I sit down with my team once or twice a year and I, I you know, get all the key people who are responsible for all the different parts of our infrastructure and our software development efforts. And, you know, I ask them, what's keeping you up at night? What's the worst thing that you think, you know, could really happen to us? Um, and I get them talking about these things and, and let people vent and let people complain, but let them, you know, really talk about issues. Um, and then, you know, for as far as formal, you know, IT audits, if you're a company who has their financials audited, usually those companies also do IT auditing services and they'll come in and they'll assess from a, an outside perspective, you know, where your risks are and, and if you're really uh, considering all the things that you should be considering. Sometimes if you've got uh, a, a, an IT team that's been with you for a long time, the knowledge is kind of inbred. They don't have a lot of, uh, you know, experience with other companies more recently. That's where having, you know, an outside company come in and do a formal IT assessment or audit, you know, can be very helpful. Right. So do, do you think that um, it seems like one of the themes across the board is that, you know, this is just a matter of time before you experience something at some level and it's about focusing on recovery as much as it is about um, deterrence and, and keeping people out. Is that is that fair to say? I, I think you know to Brian's point, you have to you know put up barriers, make it harder, make it you know not worth it for them to be you know persist beyond a certain point. Um, recovery where possible, but it may not be possible, may not always be possible. Um, I think this this has become a, a multi front you know uh, endeavor. You have to really be looking at every single possible risk. And, and just figure out you know, how to allocate resources to all of those risks in order to, to yeah. hopefully get the best outcomes for the company. That's great. I'll, I'll just jump in here. Um, just to add to that conversation is like, I think also very important for business, businesses to recognize that sometimes what you've built is now so legacy, so archaic that the supportability of it um, is is going to be too more expensive than to modernize. And, you know, whether you're using like the move it uh, file sharing um, uh, platform, again, a legacy system that's sitting on your edge, um, all the VPNs out there that are super legacy, uh, you know, software that was developed a decade ago, the people that developed it have long gone, moved on to other projects and thus are now being supported by, um, you know, offshore third parties, it, that's a recipe for disaster. And a lot of companies have their entire IT foundation built on this legacy model. Um, so recognizing where your tax surface is becoming unmanageable and exploring, is there an, a, a, a better architecture that can still deliver the services, um, and, but but be more, uh, more manageable human process wise? Um, you know, I, I, I'm traditionally a network security person, but I joke that network security is the new security through obscurity, uh, uh, which is a, a bit tongue in cheek, but um, all the things I learned and all the forensics I did in the network side is almost entirely useless now because everything is running at the, you know, the, the sixth and seventh layers and arguably the eighth layer. Um, and well, firewalls, IDSs and, and the whatnot don't really have any effect on that. They don't have the visibility. They don't have the control anymore. So um, if we keep on trying to use legacy methods uh, to secure a modern work workforce, we're going to continue to, to struggle. Are you, so are you referring more to the fact that perimeter security is kind of, you know, legacy and we have kind of cloud security is now where we're literally looking? Is that yeah, like, you know, and it's, well, where is your data and how are your users interacting with it? It certainly isn't at a, an IP level, of course, that exi that is happening. That's the pipes. But in the same analog, I don't really care where the electricity comes from. I just know it's coming to my wall to plug in. And that's how our world is going that, you know, we're sending all these layers of abstraction of, of networks and servers and file shares, etc. 
and it's just now presented in an app or a browser. Well, how we protect those systems uh, is, is substantially different than the traditional uh, what I learned in school. Again, you know, I, I run an, a firewall and a network at home for fun. I like blinky lights, but particularly, uh, you know, in my market, every company is trying to get out of the data center business. They've realized it is a, a it is a challenge to manage. It's too expensive, um, and it, it doesn't work. Uh, for the culture out here, everyone is running to SaaS, which again doesn't is not a, a silver bullet solution. In fact, there's lots of bubblegum SaaS out there that are going to be your partner in a breach. Um, but you know, moving away from expecting a very expensive network uh, equipment to be the end all and be all, uh, in my mind, is a is not going to work in the future. Yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, in essence of time, we have. Um, I'm going to skip one question and go to the the probably the most uh, hottest topic uh, of of the day and of the session. Um, I'm going to jump to question four for our panelists. So, uh, the recent explosion in accessible uh, and, and affordable generative AI tools, including ChatGPT, Copilot, OpenAI, have provided threat agents with a whole new set of capabilities as they design their attacks for the maximum effectiveness towards their criminal goals. How can IT and security leaders prepare for an onset of new and complex multifaceted attacks that are using AI platforms to enhance the efficacy of their attacks? So uh, I'll start. Um, uh, I'll start with Brian this time, just to kind of sh share some of the uh, some of the time here. Um, if you could kind of, you know, because of the the time of the session here, just keep your answers focused. Uh, what it, you know, Brian? I'll just start with you. What are we doing? What What do we do with with these advances, you know, how do we... Brief, Mike? I'll keep it really brief. Yeah. I haven't a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> You're the very clue honest. You're very honest. Does. I just know it's going to be painful, right? Uh, but I think it's premature right now to even look at that. You know, people talk about quantum computing and everything else. Uh, they, they, I think the honest answer to you is we, we just don't know. Uh, we're we're going to find out. Uh, and there's going to be new yeah. new tools to, to to buy and shiny new bubbles to have. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, I, I think where, where that comes in handy, and I did, you know, even in the, the company, is, is strength in numbers. You're not alone. So I partnered up with as many agencies as I could, um, especially banking industries. They have some phenomenal uh uh, insight to that stuff and security and they're on the kind of top of the game, rightfully so. So you can learn a lot from people by being in these partnerships, being in these associations. So so I think again, I'll keep it yeah. brief for time. Uh, I, I wish like I wish I wish I could tell you. I just don't no, know Mike. I know. I, I feel like we're waiting for the your know, swarm of of uh, six battalions of soldiers to come in. You know, I <laughs> feel like we're just waiting to see yeah. what happens. But we don't know what they're gonna come with, right? That's what it feels like. Barbara, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm I'm old enough to remember when most people didn't have access to the internet, and I saw the world change. You know, as as you know, my mom's on the internet now. You know, um, so uh, I I saw how you know back in back in the '70s and the '60s, you know, the 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 uh, the black hat hackers. You know, they were people who had access to information on how these systems worked and 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 this this gear worked, and they were able to use it for for ill. Now, then the internet came out and now people, you know, 16 year olds and at home after school were able to get access to this information in the past they wouldn't have had access to without the internet or not easily. Uh, and, and you saw a lot more activity because of that. I think now what you're going to see is you're going to see people who really don't have necessarily any really computer skills per se, but chat GPT helped them figure out what to do, right? So that's the next evolution. And, and that's that's just gonna happen. Um, I think while uh, chat, uh, I'm sorry, while uh, AI poses new risks, it's also bringing a whole lot more tooling that can help companies, you know, understand what's going on, understand their their risks. Um, so I think there's there's going to be both a lot of risks introduced by AI as well as a lot of risks addressed by AI. Uh, but it's going to be, in my opinion, uh, a bit tumultuous for the next couple of years. But you do feel it's going to be used, uh, or at least should be used, by both sides, you know, to combat each other, right? I mean, that's, that's... absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, what do you yeah. think? 
Uh, you know, I, I definitely agree with Brian that it's it's quite early days. Um, I've not seen anything really standing out like, ooh, yikes. Um, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're going to adapt. Uh, you know, as as Barbara said, it's like the bar has been lowered. Um, it is enabling more people that could potentially do bad, uh, but also on the other side, you know, on the good side. Um, but I'm not that concerned with like, uh, AI, please make me a virus and hack this company for me uh, and go. I don't see us there yet. Eventually, sure, we will. Um, but, you know, where I really see the concern is the problem with authenticity is that, you know, we are going to be struggling, whether it's GPT, it's um, stable diffusion, uh, creating images, uh, now the, you know, being able to generate video, um, we're going to have a major problem. And, you know, one of the questions, or one of the questions we skipped was about, you know, the soft layer, the the eighth layer, which is our humans and, and how they can be our biggest asset uh, and, and our human firewall, but they also are malleable they're soft they can be manipulated and the gpts are very good at that because i don't think gpts are just copying what we've already been saying uh and doing for the last uh 20 years or so on the internet um so it's not necessarily going to create novel viruses but it is going to create very realistic communications images and whatnot and and be leveraged to manipulate humans more to bypass security uh, and whatnot. Um, but the last thing I'll say is like the good side of it is like, it's very similar to the technology I specialized in, which was uh, security information and event management systems is, you know, we're sucking in, you know, billions of, of data points. The more data we can, uh, we, we try to look at as humans, the less we understand. And these SIM tools really helped bring that level of clarity. Um, the the AIs are going to enable us to look at much larger sets of data and get insights out of them. And, you know, to Barbara's point is like, you won't have to be a data scientist to do that. It will hold your hand through uh, getting value out of a pile of valueless data. Okay, that's that's a great, uh, great feedback, great answers. Um, I think uh, if I could turn it over to Jill for a second, Jill, I think we have some questions from the audience as we're approaching our, our end time. Is that right? Yeah, we do. We do have a few uh, questions in the chat. Um, I will read the first one from Jay Winters. Is it possible to collect data on attempted but failed attacks? Are there key agencies or organizations to report these attacks for further analysis and preparation? I can jump in, uh, Mike. Absolutely. And I mentioned a few of them. Uh, Homeland Security has uh, actually a lot of free stuff you can get out of them to help you protect your your your, your systems. You don't have to be a billion dollar corporation uh, to, to have that. Uh, the FBI also has a huge cyber team. Um, maybe they're looking at bigger, bigger, bigger targets, but there is associations you can go, go, go with and, uh, uh, around the world is uh, actually one in, in Hong Kong also. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, you can definitely utilize partners uh, and you can re reach out to them. And uh, certainly I can provide some contact information uh, uh, offline uh, for that. Great. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. And you can't beat the price. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So another question we have from CD is I have two questions. As a recent graduate in new in network security, what are ways to get into the cybersecurity industry, internships, or entry level? As far as the panelists go, do you want to? Anybody want to jump in and chime in on that, or I can uh, uh, give a little bit of brief briefing on that. Uh, so I, I help advise on NYT. I also help advise with uh, Simon Fraser University. I hire students. Um, I was a student at one point. Um, there's a signal to noise ratio with with applicants in this space. Um, so you need to really be able to stand out. There's a HR filter that's looking at your resume and looking for the keywords and and uh, thresholds of do you have you know 30 years of experience in cloud? Well, cloud hasn't been around for 30 years, but you will see ridiculous requirements like that. And if you can't answer those and you should answer them truthfully, you get filtered out right away. So two things I would say is understand who the actual hiring manager is find them on LinkedIn, uh, reach out to them. If you're going to do that, though, 
better have a story, right? No, uh, you know, tell them what you like doing. Uh, I'm, I'm literally on LinkedIn right now talking to somebody that was in wealth management is now pivoting to GRC. Interesting. Um, and with it, with it, with an interest in blue teaming. So I asked him the first question is like, well, tell me about your lab environment at home. And, you know, being able to articulate, Hey, I play at home because this industry changes so much. You can't just expect to, uh, be able to absorb everything nine to five. Um, you know, what are you learning? What are you most interested in, et cetera? Do you have a GitHub page that shows some of the projects you're working on? Being able to show that will will skip the HR line uh, and, and increase your likelihood uh, uh, of getting in there. And if you don't have any of that, do that because it will help you greatly uh, in getting past that line and also in the interview process of saying like, this is what I did. I broke it. I fixed it. I solved it. People want to hire people like that. My, my, Mike, and, and yep. Alex, there is more demand than there's supply. You know, I think people going into this field, cyber field, is is phenomenal because there, you know, there's going to be so many yeah. jobs. I, 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 I had a hard time getting people uh, to to come in. Yeah. You know? It's uh, Brian. It's six hundred and thirty thousand jobs in the U.S. alone. There's yeah. three million globally, but six hundred and thirty thousand as of twenty twenty three. That's unfilled open positions so and, and, and good paying and good paying positions and and oh, yeah. uh, so so i i don't think that's a problem i think uh, just reaching out to most companies are you know we'll need we'll need help and uh and i don't think you're gonna have a hard time finding a position now if it's one that you want in the location you want a different story but i i think the prospect of all careers you can go into cyber intellect and, and intellectual property uh is is two of the hardest yeah. And I will throw in, I know we're out of time, but I will throw in that just um, from our NSA designation, um, you know, they're, they're all looking for hands-on experience, uh, um, demonstrable skill sets. So if you if you want to kind of make sure that you're, you're making, you know, differentiating yourself, make sure that you can demonstrate um, the uses of uh, a lot of the different cyber tools and networking tools, especially. So um, Barbara, I didn't, uh, we didn't get any uh, final notes from you. You want to chime in at all? <laughs> I mean, you know, as far as how to, you know, get into into this more, you know, do 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 more homework, uh, right? So if you don't, you know, setting up a lab at home is one thing, but you know, look for things like online capture the flag uh, competitions or uh, you know different ways to actually hone your skills and actually uh, you know try and, and build up. Even though you know you could put it on the resume, people may or may not care, but it'll get you more comfortable with the technology if you haven't been working with it for 10, 15 years. Um, and and may help prepare you for uh, at least for interviewing because you'll be you know better versed. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you, Barbara. And I think with that we're officially out of time. I thank Barbara, Brian, and Alex for your time. And uh, I was I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. So thank you. And I think I'll turn it back over to I believe Dr. Bashti or yes. or Jill. Yep. So uh, thank you, our panelists and Michael for the great discussion on the subject that is so relevant to all of us. Uh, thank you all for participating in this event. My thanks go to the colleagues who made this event happen, Dr. Rob uh, DeFazio, Assistant Dean Jane Polizzi, and the College of Engineering staff, Ms. G uh, Jill Rogers. Thank you for joining us in the last scheduled talk in the series. Have a great afternoon. Take care, guys. Thank you again.